Good evening. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming. I'm Dr. Debbie Budd, president here at Berkeley City College, and we are thrilled that you are joining us this evening for what I would like to call our seventh in the series of our MSRI, Simons Institute, Berkeley City College partnership. Um, I would like to, before I introduce uh, Dr. Richard Karp, who will introduce our speaker, um, tell you just a little bit about Berkeley City College, because I absolutely know I see some new faces in this room. Uh, show of hands, how many of you are here for the first time at Berkeley City College? Wow, that's exciting. Thank you. Well, thank you to our wonderful speaker who's helped bring everyone out. Um, Berkeley City College is um, one of the four colleges in the Peralta Community College District, and we are one of the 112 community colleges in the state. Um, we offer two-year degrees, associate degrees for transfer. We offer career technical education programs, and we help students with their foundational skills. Um, many of you may not know that anyone can attend a community college. They, anyone who's 18 years of old, 18 years of age, whether they've attended, completed high school or not, could come to community college, get their associate's degree, and transfer to a four-year university. So we offer an incredible opportunity for many students. Um, with the cost of education, we have more and more students now coming to Berkeley City College as our first choice for their first two years. And we are thrilled with our success we have with our students. Um, we are number one in the state in the acceptance rate to UC Berkeley with our great partnerships. And we are in the top 10% uh, statewide of all of the UCs, which is really exciting. Um, and we just learned yesterday, I know we have many uh, Stanford and Cal individuals, that actually one of our students is one of the 12 uh, transfer students being accepted to Harvard this year. So we have a huge variety of uh, students, so we're excited about that. In addition to the incredible transfer programs, we do a great deal with our career technical education. We offer incredible programs to help in the field of, of multimedia, biotechnology, um, and various uh, business-related fields, and of course, computer information systems and computer science. Um, we also, in addition to transfer to UCs, students that come to Berkeley City College can receive an associate degree for transfer. It's an automatic transfer degree to a Cal State University. So we have over 11 different programs for AA degrees that once students complete that with a 2.0, they get automatic acceptance into a CSU. So if this is your first time, we have ambassadors always at Berkeley City College. We welcome you to walk in the door and say, hey, I'd love a tour. We'd love to give you a tour. Um, before I turn it over to um, our keynote speaker and the uh, sponsor, Simons Institute, I wanted to give a very special thank you to um, Dean Antonio Barrero, who has really helped with all seven of these series make it possible. So Antonio, thank you very much. And of course, our sound and light and media technology person, Brian Gibbs, who's done incredible work for us over the year. Thank you very much. So again, welcome to Berkeley City College. And without any further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Richard Karp. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie. Uh, I'm the director of an institute that was founded about two years ago called the Simons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Um, among the things we do uh, in particular is outreach to the public to uh, inform the public about interesting developments in mathematical and computational sciences. And our uh, cooperation with Berkeley City College through Debbie and with MSRI through David Eisenbud and his staff has been a great pleasure. Um, this is the uh, third, in the series of seven, this is the third one that our institute has been uh, particularly involved in. Uh, just a word about the Simons Institute. Um, we study uh, fundamental problems about computation 
that arise in a diverse set of areas, um, partly in computer science itself and information technology, uh, but also some of the problems arise in mathematics, in the physical sciences, the engineering sciences, the social sciences, and even in the world of commerce. So we take a very broad view of our field, and this is likely to be reflected in some of the future programs that we run uh, for uh, an audience like yourselves uh, at this uh, very nice uh, venue. We're very happy to have Michael Sipser as our uh, key speaker, our main speaker today. Uh, Mike got his PhD from Berkeley in 1980 in our theoretical computer science group. He spent the bulk of his career at MIT uh, as a professor of mathematics, as chair of the mathematics department, and most recently as acting dean of science for M at MIT. Uh, he's a great expositor. He's written a wonderful book in theoretical computer science. He's proved wonderful theorems, and I think you're going to enjoy his talk. The title is Beyond Computation, the P versus NP question. Mike. First, uh, thank you, Dick, for the introduction. And I want to thank Berkeley City College for hosting us and also the Simons Institute for Theoretical Computer Science and uh, the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute for um, sponsoring this event. Um, and most of all, I want to thank you all for coming out here on this uh, beautiful Berkeley evening uh, to come hear a talk about mathematics. Because um, that's what we're talking about today is mathematics. It's theoretical computer science. It's talk about computation. And, um, uh, um, and the limits of computation, but it is also a mathematical talk. Um, and not only am I going to talk about mathematics, but I'm going to tell you about a problem that I don't know to ha how to solve. Um, no one else does either, for that matter. Um, but maybe that's why you're here, uh, because you know, it's those unsolved problems Unsolved questions, unanswered questions, the, the um, open questions, as we like to say, that often are what are most inspiring to our curiosity. So I'm going to talk about a problem um, at the crossroads between mathematics and computer science called the P versus NP problem. And, um, and by the way, even though it's a math talk, I'm going to hopefully make it accessible to everybody. Uh, and if I don't, if you don't, if you get lost, well, it's my fault. Um, so uh, don't feel bad. But I, I think it'll be uh, hopefully accessible. All right. So the P versus NP problem. I, look, this is a question about what makes certain kinds of problems easy, easy to solve or quickly to solve on a computer, and other kinds of problems take a long time to solve on a computer, even though the computer is very fast. OK? So we're going to start off slow with a nice, easy example. Um, 7 times 13. So this is something we call multiplica multiplication. And uh, if your arithmetical skills are rusty, the answer to that 7 times 13 problem is 91. OK? Now, um, a related problem to multiplication is suppose I give you the product to start off with. I give you a number 91, which is, say, known to be the product of two numbers. But you don't know what those numbers are. And I ask you to figure out the two numbers that multiply together to give you 91. This is another computational or mathematical problem. And we call that the factoring problem. We start out with the product, and we try to figure out the two numbers that multiply together to give you that product. OK, so in this case, the problem is 91, and the answer is 7 times 13. OK, now let's take uh, a bigger example of multiplication. So this is probably not the kind of problem that you can do in your head, at least if you're a normal person. Uh, but um, you can type this into a computer, um, and um, even a laptop, push 
the, um, if you have the right software, push multiply, and the answer will pop out almost instantaneously. Um, so this multiplication problem, even though it's for big numbers, will take very, you know, because computers are so fast, even using the standard algorithm that you learn in third grade for multiplying, it can run through the calculation very quickly and get you the answer in a second, or even less. Now, here is where it becomes interesting. Suppose I take that product and I, I forgot the two numbers that multiply together to give you that product. And now I want to find those two numbers, just like we did before. This is a factoring problem. Okay, so here's the product, and I want to know what two numbers multiply together to give you that number. Well, you can solve that problem on a computer, just like we did for multiplication. And somebody actually did that. But the, here's the difference. Instead of taking a second for doing the multiplication, doing this factoring problem took 20 computer years of effort, 20 computer years of computer time. Now, they didn't actually wait for 20 years. They ran this on a highly parallel uh, set of computers, so they were all a bunch of computers working together on this problem. But if you add up the total amount of computer effort that was involved, it was 20 computer years, years of effort to do this factoring. Now, first of all, you might ask, well, you know, well, who cares? You know, why did somebody invest so much time to do this factoring? Well, people do care. And in particular, the person who did this uh, exercise of factoring that number got $20,000 for doing that calculation. That's not bad. Uh, now, you may ask, well, first of all, who is paying $20,000 to factor big numbers? And you know, are there any other numbers out there that people might want to factor that you know, we, all, we can also get in on this act? Well, you know, let's take this number here. This is a $30,000 number. OK, no one knows the factors of this one. Now, um, so, so who, but who's paying? Um, well, first of all, I'm lying. Uh, the, the people who are paying uh, decided to get out of that game. So we missed out our opportunity. That's no longer the, 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 the um, Payment for factoring big numbers has not, uh, that's been discontinued. So, but still people are interested. And mathematicians are very, uh, work very hard on understanding how to factor big numbers. So, but still, who was paying? Well, th there's a company called RSA Security, and they're involved with cryptography. Sending encrypted messages on the internet, you know, your bank transactions, for example, in a, such a way that no one else can see what the transaction is or interfere with it. So there are cryptographic codes that rely on their security uh, for, uh, uh, that rely for their security on the difficulty, on the presumed difficulty of factoring big numbers. If you were to be able to factor things quickly, then you would break that code. So um, the people who created this code and created that company are very interested to know whether people find fast ways of factoring numbers. And so I think to keep their kind of finger on the pulse of what's going on out there in the factoring technology world, they were offering these prizes. Now, they've gotten out of that business. Um, but still, Factoring is an important ingredient in modern day cryptography, and that's where at least the practical interest in factoring uh, or f uh, algorithms for factoring comes from, though mathematicians have been interested in factoring for centuries. Okay, so what is so hard about factoring? What makes it different from multiplying? Well, you know, when you're multiplying two numbers, you can, in a sense, construct the answer out of the problem. There is a procedure which constructs the answer. But when you're factoring uh, a number, you want to find those two numbers that multiply together, the only way that people know how to solve that problem is essentially to search for the factors. No one has a procedure, essentially. You know, there are little things that you can do, but essentially no one knows how to factor numbers kind of by constructing the factors. 
The only way that people know how to do it is by looking for the factors. And when you have a big number, the number of possibilities you would have to search through in order to find the factors might be astronomically big. There are more possibilities than there are seconds in the lifetime of the universe or atoms you know, in the galaxy. So they were talking about such huge numbers that when you're trying to search through a space that, that that's so long, it's going to take you a very, very long time. Because there are so many possible factors. So the question that we're interested in today is whether there is some other way to factor numbers that avoids that brute force search through many possibilities. Maybe there's another procedure for factoring that is more direct, that constructs the answer instead of looking for the answer. That's the essential question of, the, of today. Is searching necessary when you're factoring, or we'll see this comes up in many other problems as well, or is there some way to avoid searching in these kinds of problems? The answer to that question is, at present, unknown. Whether searching is necessary for certain kinds of problems like factoring. Okay, Let me give you another example. It's called the clique problem. So here you're given a bunch of nodes, we call them. Uh, they might represent people, say. And the lines or edges between the nodes might represent the relationships between the people. So you would say you put a line between two nodes representing people if these two people know each other. And now you want to have, like, go out for dinner. You want to get a group of people together, all of whom know each other. And here is your collection of friends, let's say. And you want to look in there to, for some group, let's say, of three people who know each other, because you want to go out to dinner. So here is a group. These, this, this group here, these three, are a, what's called a clique. These are people who all know each other. They're all connected by these edges. But these three here are not a clique, because this, this pair here, they don't know each other. So for the purposes of constructing your dinner party, you're not going to invite them, let's say. So as a mathematical question, we abstract that into just this mathematical structure here, this graph. And we're trying to find these cliques. So here's a three clique, a four clique. You know, these are all nodes that are all connected to one another. And you're given your collection of nodes, your friends, say, whatever. You want to see how big a clique you can find. Because you want to you know, make the biggest dinner party you can, let's say. Um, so you know, it's easy to see there is, we already saw that there were three nodes all connected to each other. There are four uh, somewhere in here. I, I know that's true. Uh, like uh, these four here, this like kite-shaped thing. These all four, all four are connected. How about five? Well, not so obvious. And turns out there are five that are connected to each other. These five, if you, uh, I don't know if you can see that. Maybe this will help you out. Um, so there, are, there is a five clique in this uh, graph. And in general, we want to know, you know, can we find a clique of a certain size, or what's the biggest clique in a graph? So you know, if you have a bigger set of friends, um, that becomes a more challenging problem to answer. And you can certainly do it by going through all the possible collections. If you want to say, well, I want to get together eight friends now for, to go out for dinner, but they all have to know each other, you're going to have to go through lots and lots and lots of possibilities in order to see if you can find your, those collection of friends which um, you know, all know each other, um, at least as far as we know. Maybe there's some other way to solve this problem that doesn't involve going through all the possibilities. Um, and if you have hundreds and hundreds of friends trying to find the biggest group that all know each other, the biggest clique here, might take centuries of computer time because there are so many possibilities to go through. Okay? And again, we ask, can you solve this problem in some other way that doesn't involve searching through all of those possibilities? We don't know. This is an unsolved question in mathematics and theoretical computer science. Okay? And this is the essence of what we call the P versus NP problem. Um, they, they, these are both examples of what I would call, let me say, 
talk about this first, of the needle in the haystack problem. OK? So um, I've actually you know, I've given this talk a couple of times. And you know, there are, sometimes there are a lot of uh, people from other countries. And they don't know what hay is. So here, this is, this is you know, hay. This is stuff we feed to you know, uh, farm animals. And you know, there is this haste, needle in a haystack problem. means you're trying to look for a needle somewhere in that stack of hay, which looks like a hard problem. Um, so, um, you know, because finding the needle might involve searching through lots and lots of possibilities. You have to look at that piece of hay by piece of hay, one by one, seeing if you can find that needle. So that's another example of a searching problem in a kind of a practical case, not a mathematical case. Now, kind of abstracting it slightly, here's a, another picture of a haystack. Um, and you know, you want to know whether finding the needle in your haystack involves searching, or is there some way to do it without searching? Well, if you have a magnet, you can just pull that needle out <laughs> without having to search for it. And really what we're asking here is whether there is in those other problems that I just described, the factoring problem and the clique problem, is there a mathematical analog of the magnet? Some way which pulls out the, the, the answer without having to search for it. OK, so this phenomenon is pervasive. It exists in hundreds and hundreds of real world problems that people really care about. This question of problems that can be solved using searching, but that's too slow, so we'd like to find a faster way of solving them that avoids the search. You know, for example, you know, it's near the end of the semester, so it's time for final exams. And you'd like to try to find a schedule for the final exams so that there aren't too many students who have to take two final exams at the same time. That's called a scheduling problem. And there are many varieties of scheduling problem. Well, if you want to find the schedule that optimizes, minimizes the number of uh, conflicts, you, you, know, you can do that by searching through all possible schedules. Um, that's, of course, astronomically big. Um, and no one really knows if you want to find the absolute best answer of a way to do that that's faster than this brute force search through all possible schedules. So scheduling is an example of a searching problem. If you want to, for example, color a map, like you used to do, you know, my teacher used to assign those when they, did, you know, when they were in, in second grade, when the teacher wanted to do something else, they would give these maps, and you have to color them in. Um, and of course, two countries that share a boundary have to be a different color. You want to know, given a map, what's the minimum number of crayons you need to color the map so that you don't have any uh, countries that border one another with the same color? Um, so that problem, no one knows how to solve that problem um, in general, even for a map that you can write down on a surface of, on a piece of paper, a planar map, uh, to minimize the number of colors without searching through all possible colorings. And again, so many, many colorings out there. Um, you know, uh, essentially. I mean, there are sometimes a few shortcuts you can do, but still the only way of solving these problems, as far as we know, involves a search through a large space of possibilities. Um, there are problems in computational biology. You want to see if you, you're given a, you know, an amino acid sequence. You want to find the configuration that it folds into, which minimizes the total energy. Um, because presumably that's the, uh, the configuration that exists inside the cell. Well, if you want to solve this problem in general so that it works for any possible amino acid sequence, this is another case where finding the optimal folding involves searching through essentially all possible or many, many possible foldings. And there, there are so many of them. Um, there, there is theorem proving. I'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, all, variety of puzzles, Sudoku and so on. Uh, traveling salesman problem, you know, there, there, there are hundreds of these, maybe thousands, where problems that you can solve them by searching, but it's very inefficient, takes very, it's very slow, and no one knows if there's a better way. Um, and that's the, that's the essence of this problem called the P versus NP problem, P versus NP question. 
can we solve these problems which seem to involve searching, but without actually resorting to the search? Can we solve these apparently search problems in a more direct way than actually searching? And so um, that addresses all of those problems that we just discussed, clique, factoring, you know, protein folding, and so on. This phenomenon is, is, uh, appears in all of them. Okay, let's just talk for a minute about, this is not essential to understanding the presentation, but let's just try to define the terms here. Uh, P stands for the polynomial time. These are the problems that you can solve in a number of steps that grows only as a polynomial in the size of the problem. Solving a problem by searching for the answer will in general require an exponential number of steps. So these searching procedures are not polynomial time procedures. So the polynomial time class of problems are the problems like multiplication where you can solve them without searching. But whether, for example, the clique problem is in polynomial time is not known. Because if it were, then you would be avoiding the search for the clique problem. So these are the problems that can essentially be solved without searching because searching is too slow to operate in polynomial time. Now, NP is a slightly more complicated notion. These are problems where you may not necessarily be able to find the answer quickly in a polynomial number of steps in the size of the problem, but you can check the answer quickly. So let's understand what that means. Like in the case of factoring, there is something interesting about factoring because even though it might take you a very long time to find the factors because of that brute force search, once you've found them, you can easily check that you got the right answer by, just by multiplying them to see if you get the, the, the starting point. Similarly, if your problem, your clique problem is, well, does the graph have a clique of size 20? It might take you a long number, many, many steps to actually find, to run through all the possibilities and find such a clique. But once you actually found one, it's easy to check that it works. So there are many, many problems that have this character um, that uh, it seems like you need to search for the answer, but once you find the answer, it's easy to check that it's right. That's the essence of NP. These are the quickly checkable problems as opposed to the quickly solvable problems. And they include all the search problems that we just mentioned. Okay. So just in terms, you know, thinking about in terms of like a Venn diagram uh, of classes of problems, so th 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 these circles here represent whole classes of all the of computational problems like factoring, clique, traveling salesman, and so on. Um, the P problems are the ones that are easy, easily solvable, like multiplication or sorting or any of those problems where you can do, get the answer quickly, whereas NP are the problems where you, you may need, uh, w w where the answer, once you find it, is easily checkable, but actually finding the answer might involve searching for it. So these are really the searching problems out here, and these are the problems that can be solved without searching. So if it turns out that searching can, that we can always eliminate searching, then these two classes would collapse down and be the same. Right? If, if you can always eliminate searching for these, NP prob for these pl problems that are in NP, then they would collapse down and become P problems, so problems that you can solve, solve quickly. And so then P would equal NP in that case. But if there are certain problems in this class which really require searching, then they would not be in, in P and you would have P different from NP. Okay, so that's a little bit on the technical side, but uh, that's where this terminology comes from. 
the P versus NP really amounts to, does P equal NP, which means you can always eliminate searching, or P is different from NP, which means that sometimes searching is essential. Cannot be eliminated in some cases. And the answer as to which of those cases is the actual uh, reality is not known. Okay, that's the P versus NP problem. So let's talk a, a little bit about of the history of the problem, because it's interesting. Um, if you go back to the 1960s, that was when the whole subject of complexity theory got set up. Um, some of these folks are my teachers. Um, in the early uh, 70s, the P versus NP question was first formulated, and its companion notion of NP completeness was proposed. We'll talk about that in a second. And uh, I'm very pleased that Dick Karp, who introduced me, is, was one of the key uh, contributors uh, to this whole development. But one thing that was discovered, I don't know, now it's been 15 to 20 years ago, is that there was actually a precursor to the whole thing that appeared in a letter Kurt Gödel, the great logician, wrote to the, uh, to the mathematician John von Neumann. So there was a letter which foreshadowed the whole development. And it appeared back in 1956, almost 10 years before any of this appeared in the literature, which is kind of amazing. So I thought I would just show you the letter here. Here it is, in fact. It's a little hard to read, not only because of the, the printing is small, but it's in German. Um, and it was found in von Neumann's archives, uh, something around, I don't remember exactly, but around 20 years ago. Uh, I thought I would just translate a few bits and pieces of it, just because it's interesting to see the language that was used. And, and actually, for those of you who know something about the subject, what's amazing to me, anyway, about this letter is the modern terminology that he uses much before any of this appeared in the literature. Uh, oops. Oh, yeah, here, here's the letter. Let me, I want to tell you first who, uh, who these people are in case you didn't know. Kurt Gödel was, many people think of him as the greatest logician who ever lived or the greatest logician since Aristotle. You know, he was an amazing person who did all sorts of stuff in, in mathematical logic. Uh, uh, and among his many accomplishments was sort of this idea, understanding of this question about computation, which was only known by virtue of that letter that, that, that appeared in von, Neum von Neumann's arch archives. Uh, John von Neumann was a great uh, mathematician who worked in a whole variety of fields. He is known in particular for having worked in computer science. He was an early computer pioneer. He's known for the so-called von Neumann architecture. I don't know if he was actually the only one to think of that concept, but this notion that you can uh, store the program of the computer in the computer itself. So let's turn our, turn our attention back to this letter. Uh, so the letter starts off, and I'm translating little bits and pieces of it. Lieber Herr von Neumann, that's the, that's the opening here, dear Mr. von Neumann, uh, Princeton, March 20th, 1956. Kind of a curious side note is that both Gödel and von Neumann were at the Institute for Advanced Study at the time, presumably down the hall from one another. <laughs> so why exactly there, Gödel was right, wrote this in a letter to von Neumann? I do not exactly know, but you can make you know maybe he just wanted to get it down in print, or maybe uh, you know uh, von Neumann at the time actually was rather sick. He was dying of cancer, died less than a year later. Maybe he just was not, uh, maybe he was hospitalized. I actually don't know. Uh, but in fact, the whole beginning part of the, uh, the first page of the letter talks about how um, Gödel is aware that von Neumann is unwell and he hopes he gets better. And he says, at the end of the first thing, he says, well, you know, uh, now let's turn to some mathematics. Um, and here then he talks about, um, here's really, what he's asking here is, is, I have to explain this. He's talking about the problem of how hard it is for computers to test whether a mathematical statement has a proof of a certain specified length. OK, so you give a length n, and I want to know, you give a length n, you give the statement, and the computer is supposed to check does that statement has a, have a proof of length n? Now, if you, if you eliminate the n, if you say, does, it, does the statement have a proof at all, we know that's not solvable by computer. That was actually derived from some of Gödel's work himself. 
But if you put the bound on, if you say, does it have a proof of length n, well, of course, it's now solvable, because you can just try all possible proofs of length n and, you know, and see if any of them are legitimate proofs of the statement you're trying to prove. It's a finite problem. But that's a searching solution. You have to search. That procedure involves searching through all possible proofs of length n, and there are so many of them. So what Gödel is asking here is, how much time does it take to test, this is his function phi of n, that's how much time the, it would take to solve the problem for proofs of length n. How, how long would it take if you have an optimal machine instead of just the brute force searching machine? Maybe there's some better way. So how long, does an opt how long would an optimal machine take to test if your statement has a proof of length n? This is the p versus np question right there, formulated in a slightly different language. But this is really the p versus np question. You know, we might quibble slightly, but this is basically it. Then he goes on to talk about blossen probieren, which is, I'm told, I'm not, uh, not a German speaker, but it means uh, blind probing, which I think loosely, in, loosely is brute force search or exhaustive search. That's searching. Um, and then he goes on to talk about other problems besides testing whether a statement has a proof of a certain length. He talks about testing if a number is prime. Or in general, other finite combinatorial problems. He doesn't specifically mention clique, but I think that's the kind of problem he has in mind. So we really hear in this, in this letter, he actually has carved out a vision for where the field ends up, ended up going. I think it's an amazing discovery in the history of science that this letter was found in von Neumann's archives. Anyway, and, th and then he starts signs it at the end, Kurt Gödel. So um, in the years since Gödel's letter, you know, there's been a lot of literature and the whole subject has developed. And this problem now has become celebrated as one of the great, it's probably the greatest unsolved problem in theoretical computer science, and it's considered one of the great problems in contemporary mathematics. So there are these, some of you may know, there in the year 2000, there were these clay millennium problems posed. Uh, these are supposedly seven unsolved problems put together by a committee inspired by the Hilbert problems, if you've heard of those, but it doesn't matter that were a century earlier, but these were put together in the year 2000, kind of as challenges to the mathematical community for the coming century. And as you can see, the P versus NP problem is considered, is, was one of those seven grand challenge problems in mathematics. One of these problems has a check mark next to it because that problem actually was one of the, the seven grand ch challenge problems that's already been solved. So these are not impossible problems. Uh, they can be solved. That Poincaré conjecture was 100 years old when it was solved. And there's a whole story behind it. You know, the guy who solved it was a little bit strange. He, uh, you, know, um, you know, I should mention one difference between the Clay problems and the, and the um, Hilbert problems is that there's a million dollar bounty on solving any one of these problems. And the guy who solved the Poincaré conjecture didn't want the million dollars. He said, you know, what's a million dollars compared with the glory of solving the Poincaré conjecture? Which I, can, which I can understand. You know, uh, this is a problem you know, for the ages, and you know, how does that, how does a million dollars compare with that? Um, so, um, so, all right. Let me tell you, now, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the P versus NP problem. Uh, people know that it's a problem I'm interested in, and lots of people send me solutions. <laughs> Um, uh, I get phone calls, I get letters, and so on. Uh, so, um, and you know, many of the solutions I'm really kind of simplifying, but it's, it's actually true. They, 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 um, they kind of, some class of, of quote solutions amounts to essentially, well, these problems are searching problems, and of course you need to search to do searching problems. The end. <laughs> so what I want to show you here is that it's not so simple. You know, testing if a number is prime looks like a searching problem. Right? You have a big number, 
to, you want to know, is it prime? Does it have any non-trivial, does it have any factors you know, besides one and itself? So can you actually factor that number in some interesting way? I think most of us know what prime numbers are. Um, uh, and you want to know, you want to test if a number is prime. So one way to do it is by searching. You can search for factors, and if you don't find any uh, factors, then you know it's prime. Uh, but there's another way. And uh, let me give you a taste of how that goes. It uses some number theory. But not, at least at the very most elementary level, it's not, you know, it's sort of understandable. So here's a strange way to test primality, and this is, it's based on this following principle that's going to ultimately be used to avoid the searching. Um, it relies on this old theorem due to Fermat. It's like, you know, it's not Fermat's last theorem, it's another theorem that he actually did prove. Um, uh, and um, it, it's the following simple statement, but you have to bear with me on this. This is as technical as, as the talk gets. Okay, it's not that bad. Um, if I have to take a prime P, any old prime, like 7, and I take any number uh, from 1 up to P minus 1, so any number that's less than P, call it A, like maybe 2. If I take that number A and I raise it to the P minus 1 power, and then I divide by P and take the remainder, that's what this means, mod p. Divide by p and take the remainder. I always get 1 coming out. It's kind of amazing when you actually try it in practice. Why in the world should that be? Well, Fermat proved it. It's not actually that hard to prove. But let, let, let's just illustrate this with an example. OK? So let's take the case I mentioned. p equals 7. a equals 2. OK? So you can take 2 to the 6th power, that's a to the p minus 1, 2 to the 6th power, that's 64, okay? Now divide by 7. Well, 7 goes into 63 evenly. So the remainder, when you divide it into 64, is going to be 1. Of course, this is, just, this is no proof, this is just an example, but it always works. Now, contrast that with what happens if you started with p equal to 15 which is well known for not being a prime number. Uh, OK, so p is, we start with 15, a non-prime. Let's try plugging in the same thing, see what happens. Well, you, you take a equal to 2 again. Now you get 15 minus 1, p minus 1 is 2 to the 14th. That's this number here. And if you, take the, if you divide by 15, you get a remainder of 4. And 4 is not 1. That tells you something. It tells you that 15 is not prime. Because this calculation resulted in a number other than 1 here, it resulted in 4, I have just proven to you that 15 is not a prime number. Of course, we knew that. right? But it proves it in an entirely different way. It, proves, it says that 15 is not prime because it fails to have a property that all prime numbers have. And so therefore, it couldn't be prime. It doesn't say anything about 15's factors, by the way. And this is kind of the basic, the starting point for a procedure that allows you to test primality. First, there was a procedure that worked kind of with a randomized, uh, and then ultimately the randomization was removed. And so primality testing is now known to be solvable in polynomial time. So you can cut out the searching entirely. using. Um, using this, uh, uh, this, is, this idea is the starting point. OK, so I mentioned this notion of NP-completeness. OK, um, so NP-completeness is probably, well, perhaps it was a very important early development in trying to understand this whole phenomenon of P versus NP. And what it tells you is this, that you know, we have all of these searching problems factoring, clique, and a variety of others. But it turns out that in many cases, the question of whether or not these problems require searching is related to each other. 
So let me say that slightly better. What we can show by virtue of this NP completeness method is that if I can find a procedure which solves the clique problem without searching, so a polynomial time algorithm for the clique problem, if I can do that, so if I can get rid of clique, searching for clique, then I can get rid of searching for factoring. Now you understand? This is kind of a miracle. You know, what does factoring and clique have to do with each other? But by eliminating searching from the solution to the clique problem, I immediately get a way of eliminating searching for the factoring problem. So how in the world does that, what, what, how do you prove that? Because this is, this is known. It's because there is a way that you can demonstrate, and this is very concretely done, too complicated for me to say here, but at least the idea I can say, you, you can convert factoring problems into, into clique problems by a transformation that itself is fast. So in other words, I can kind of hide a factoring problem as a clique problem. I can encode it as a clique problem. So now if I can then solve clique problems without searching, well, I've, I've solved my factoring problem because I represented my factoring problem as a clique problem. So I've kind of illustrate that here. OK, so that's the idea. I can convert a factoring problem into a clique problem and then solve the clique problem. That's the, that's the essence of NP completeness. And well, I mean, one more point is that clique is a special problem because every NP problem, every one of these problems that has easy checkability, as we mentioned at the beginning, can be transformed by some trans fast transformer into a clique problem. So we call that, we say that clique is NP complete. So in other words, if you can solve the clique problem fast, you can solve every NP problem fast. So clique is special. And many of these, many problems in NP are known to be special in that way. Those are called NP complete. Um, and therefore, if you can solve clique in P, then every NP problem can be solved in P. You can always eliminate searching for these easily checkable problems. So you've kind of focused the entire complexity of this class of NP problems onto a single problem, the clique problem, or any one of the other NP complete problems. OK, so now, um, OK, so this is kind of gives the I sense. These NP, these NP complete problems are, in a sense, the hardest, because if you can solve any one of these, you've solved them all. OK? I thought I'd mention too, just you know, sort of in getting a little bit into the home stretch of what I'm, uh, of my lecture, that, you know, the world is a complicated place. There are certain kinds of search problems which seem to be transcend even NP. These are searching problems where, once you find the answer, you don't necessarily have, as far as we know, an easy way of checking the answer. And I'll give you, just to illustrate that, it's the problem of testing which side has a winning, has a forced win in a game like chess, or any of a variety of games. If you, um, and you have to, gen I know for the experts on there, you have to talk about generalizations here, but let, let's just be loose. Uh, for in a game like chess, um, the, uh, you know, if I want to know What's the outcome if both sides play optimally? Does white win? Does black win? Or is it, a, or is it always a draw? It, under, under optimal play, if both sides were the best possible players. No one knows the answer to that. But you could find it out using a computer that would search through the entire tree of possibilities. So there is a kind of a searching procedure, because the, the tree is astronomically big, you'll never be able to do it in the lifetime of the universe. But in principle, you can get the answer. And suppose you determine by searching this tree that white does, in fact, have a forced win. How do you check that? No, th that's not something we know how to do. So this is a problem which is a searching problem which seems even outside of the NP class. It's a searching problem that doesn't have this easy checkability, as far as we know. And this is one of these, you know, this, well, as far as we know. Um, OK. so. 
just to give you a sense of the lay of the land, you know, in the many years that complexity theorists have been looking at these kinds of things, you know, they place these problems here. Optimal games is in a, is in a class called, not, called polynomial space. These can be solved with a polynomial amount of memory, not necessarily a polynomial amount of time. Here are the clique and factoring problems in this NP class as we saw. Here's multiplication down in the P class. But complexity theorists have been hard at work trying to come up with other methods of categorizing problems in a natural way, almost like the periodic table in, in some loose sense. So there's a variety of different classes out there that people have discovered um, corresponding to classifying problems in different ways. And the whole subject is still uh, evolving. So if you focus here on, for example, the primality problem, uh, it used to be up here in this RP class, which stands for randomized polynomial time. But uh, about you know, a dozen years ago, a procedure for eliminating the randomization was shown. So it's fairly recently, you know, the, the, this picture has, has changed. And you know, it's, uh, other changes are possible. So, you know, so we have this unsolved problem, P versus NP. How might we actually answer it? Of course, I don't know. Um, but uh, we can speculate. You know, one possible method that is, uh, suggests itself would be you, know, you want to um, show that there's no clever way to solve a problem like the clique problem. You have to search. If you want to prove P is different from NP, which is what most people believe, not necessarily everybody, but most people believe P different from NP, that these problems really require searching, um, then you, uh, for you, a, a fast algorithm is kind of your adversary. You want to prove that there's no fast algorithm for the clique problem, because you believe searching is necessary. So the fast procedures are kind of the bad guys. You don't like the fast procedures. You want to show there aren't any of those. So this is the fast procedure, which is claiming to solve the clique problem. But the problem is that fast procedure can be very clever. It can do crazy things, like that procedure for testing primality. Can, all sorts of things. That who knows what it could do? So um, one way, perhaps, is to get a handle on it by limiting the class of procedures that you'll allow. You handicap the computer. So you take it with a stick, you hit the computer, and so now the computer, instead of being able to run, can only kind of limp. And maybe you, now you can prove the computer has to take a long time to solve the problem because it's limping. If that doesn't work, you give it another whack. <laughs> now the poor computer can only crawl. Eventually, enough whacks, you can prove something. And then maybe you can start to relax some of these handicaps that you put on the computation, and you learn something about what it takes to show that there are no clever algorithms. Um, all right, another possibility would be you want to take your algorithm, which supposedly is working fast for the clique problem, and you want to somehow find a very complicated input. And say, on this input, it's going to have to take a long time. Um, well, uh, you know, if you want to find a complicated case, it's sort of natural to work with a very big instance. The bigger the problem, sort of the more complicated it is. And to a mathematician, that sort of suggests, why don't we take that to, to its most extreme? Let's try to give it an infinite input. Whatever that means. OK, try to make sense of that and to show that maybe on this infinite input, it's easier somehow to say that the machine has to take up a long time. Again, you're not clear what these means, but you can make some sense of these things. Um, OK, but you know, all the, none of these approaches have panned out in the end, um, unfortunately. Um, and so you, know, you can ask, well, will the problem ever be solved? Uh, I believe it will, but we'll certainly need new ideas to do so. Thank you.